Hi. In this video, we are going to be discussing the prerequisite lemmas for the inverse function theorem proof. So in the video on the inverse function theorem, we made use of these three lemmas without proof at that point, and here, for the sake of completeness, we will give the statements and the proofs for each of these statements. First, the reverse triangle inequality, second, the contraction mapping principle, and third, the mean value inequality. So let's get going on each of these in the order that they appear here. So we'll begin with the statement of the reverse triangle inequality. So it's very similar in nature to the typical triangle inequality, which is even more elementary than this. Um, so this is applying for vectors x and y in Rn, n-dimensional real vectors. Um, and so what it says is it says that the norm of the difference of these vectors, x minus y, and you take the norm of that, that's at least the size of um, here, <laughs> this is a uh, three bars in a row, the exterior most bar on the left and on the right here, these are absolute value bars, and then, um, and then the subsequent two bars here and here, uh, and then the same thing surrounding the y, those are norm bars. So sorry, that's just how the typesetting uh, works out. I wish I could modify that, but in any case, um, what this is saying is on the right-hand side, this is the absolute value of the difference of the norms of x and y. Okay, so just saying it all at once, uh, this is saying that the, the norm of the difference is at least the difference of the norms in absolute values. And that's always true no matter which vectors x and y you pick. The proof of the reverse triangle inequality uh, follows a very similar structure to the proof of the typical triangle inequality. Uh, and in fact, it follows immediately if you assume the typical triangle inequality. And that's elementary enough that we will assume that here. So uh, RTI, that's the reverse triangle inequality, that's equivalent uh, with this set of two inequalities that you see here. So um, in the middle here, you see the difference of the norms of uh, x and y. And that is what appeared on the, uh, the right-hand side of the inequality, in other words, the lower bound um, on the uh, statement of the reverse triangle inequality. Uh, this was in absolute values. Um, and so what it means for something in absolute values to be uh, less than or equal to um, the, uh, you know, this quantity here, the norm of x minus y, well, if this is in absolute values, that means two things. When you take off the absolute values, that means it's simultaneously uh, one greater than or equal to the negative of the norm of x minus y, and two, it's less than or equal to the, uh, the norm of x minus y. So it's bigger than the negative situation, and it's less than the positive situation. Um, and so if we just take a look at those two inequalities uh, separately, we can verify them both immediately. So inequality 2 is what we'll look at first. So 2 is equivalent with saying, um, well, so, so why is the statement true? Just take the norm of x. You can rewrite that cleverly as uh, the norm of y plus x minus y and then use the typical triangle inequality. And uh, so the, the norm of, uh, this is gonna be smaller than the norm of y plus the norm of x minus y. And then uh, just doing rearranging where you take this norm of y and move it to the left-hand side over here and you'll have norm of x minus norm of y uh, is less than or equal to the norm of x minus y. And so we'll give it a check mark there. That is um, what this uh, second inequality is saying. The first inequality is very, very similar. So, um, so one is equivalent with uh, rewriting uh, now y, uh, and you have uh, you can rewrite this as the norm of x plus y minus x, um, and, uh, and that's smaller than the norm of x plus the norm of x minus y. Again, you just uh, do some algebraic rearrangement, moving this x to the other side, and. Uh, and you'll have that, um, that y minus x, the, the norms of those things, is smaller than the norm of x minus y. And, uh, and then you just uh, divide both sides by minus, and the inequality will flip, and you'll have what you want. So uh, that proves the uh, first inequality as well. So both inequalities are true, and so therefore uh, you can collapse that into one statement, uh, again, which is the reverse triangle inequality. The next lemma that we made use of in the uh, video is the contraction mapping principle. So first, just to make sure we're all on the same terms, it's good to uh, define contraction mapping. So a contraction mapping uh, is a function f, which has the property that the norm of f of x minus f of y is going to be at most uh, c times the norm of x minus y, uh, where c is some constant, uh, it's, it's non-negative and it's strictly less than 1. 
So in other words, the outputs are closer together than the inputs were, because the distance between the inputs was x minus y in norms, and the distance between the outputs is uh, the norm of f of x minus f of y, and of course that's smaller than uh, this quantity here, uh, which is strictly smaller than the norm of x minus y. So because the outputs are closer together than the inputs, that's why we call it a contraction mapping. And so CMP, the contraction mapping principle, what that states is that uh, if we take x uh, to be a closed subset of Rn, and f is a function that takes that set x to itself, uh, that, which is a contraction mapping, uh, then there's going to exist a unique point x and x uh, such that f of x equals x. Uh, and by the way, this uh, point x here, which has this property, is typically called a fixed point of the function. So in other words, what the contraction mapping principle is saying here is that any contraction mapping on a closed subset of Rn to itself has a unique fixed point. So the proof of this is decidedly less simple than the proof of the reverse triangle inequality, so this will take a little bit of work on our part. Um, all the same, we can get through it without too much trouble, I think. So here's how the proof is going to work. We're going to take a point x0 in uh, this big set x, which is a, again a closed subset of Rn, uh, take an arbitrary point, take any point you want, and we're going to define uh, this recursive sequence, uh, x sub k plus 1 is going to be f of x sub k. So you start with x0, then you apply f, that'll give you x1, then you apply f again, that'll give you x2, then you apply f again, that'll give you x3, uh, and so on. So that gives you an infinite sequence by iteratively applying this function f over and over again. Uh, so now if this sequence xk uh, were convergent to some point x and x, uh, that would be nice because what we could say then uh, is that f of x uh, is equal to the, uh, this limit here, the limit of um, this uh, f of x sub k uh, sequence, um, and that's just true be by the, uh, by the continuity of the function f. Uh, contraction mappings, by the way, are, um, they're much stronger than being continuous. In fact, they're stronger than being Lipschitz continuous. Um, so, uh, so in particular, they're continuous, and so we can use this uh, limit property here. Um, so f is a continuous function, and so f of x equals uh, this limit here. And just applying the definition of what uh, x of k is, this is the limit as k goes to infinity of x of k plus 1. Uh, which of course is only incrementing the index by one, and um, and that has no effect on the limit. The limit is uh, of the sequence is still x, as we've already assumed. So in total, you, what you have is f of x equals x. Uh, and so, in other words, if the sequence were convergent, then we would have a fixed point because the limit of that sequence would be a fixed point of the function. Uh, so, therefore, it suffices to show that the sequence is indeed convergent, um, and then also we need to make sure that f can have at most one fixed point, uh, because if you recall, the statement is saying that there exists a unique fixed point. Uh, the contraction mapping has a unique fixed point, and so um, here what we're doing is we're saying that if the sequence is convergent, then we'll have one, and we also need to make sure uh, that uh, we will have exactly one, uh, but we will uh, ensure that at the end of the proof. Now you might have heard me reference in the beginning that the statements that we're proving in this video are lemmas. Uh, that's one way of phrasing them, but in fact this is an even smaller lemma that we're going to prove now, uh, and this is going to serve the purpose of helping us prove the contraction mapping principle. So this is a sub-lemma, if you will. Uh, so uh, what we want to prove now, uh, for the purpose of helping us prove the contraction mapping principle, is that if we have this infinite sum here, so we take um, vectors a, k that are in uh, Rn, so n-dimensional vectors, uh, each of them, and we take their norms, and we take the norms of all those vectors and we add them up, and we have infinitely many of them, if that, so that's going to give us an infinite series, and if that infinite series is convergent, then that guarantees us that the infinite a series of the vectors themselves is also convergent. And just to make sure we're on the same page, what it means for an infinite sum of vectors to converge is that it means that the infinite sum of the individual components all converge. Uh, and so if they all converge, then whatever the, the convergent um, values are, that's the uh, overall convergent vector that, uh, that this sum is, is converging to. So uh, anyways, um, again, one more time, this is saying that uh, the sum of the norms being convergent guarantees us that the sum of the initial vectors is also convergent.
So let's prove this, and then we'll see how this will help us in the proof of the contraction mapping principle. So the proof of the lemma is pretty straightforward. Um, what you do is you assume that, uh, or sorry, well, you define akj uh, to be the jth component of the vector ak. So ak, again, this is an n-dimensional vector, so akj is picking out the jth component of that vector. Um, and we'll take note of the fact that the absolute value of akj is going to be at most the norm of ak. Um, that follows, you can just prove that algebraically very, very simply, uh, but even simpler than that is just to think about it geometrically what this means. Um, the absolute value of akj is the length of the individual component, uh, the individual jth component of this vector, um, whereas this, on the right-hand side, is the length of the overall vector. And obviously, the length of the overall vector is going to be uh, at least the size of the length of any individual components. So that's why this inequality is true. Uh, what we use that inequality for now is to take note of the fact that the sum of the absolute value of akjs, um, that's going to be at most the sum of the uh, norms of the aks. And we are assuming that the sum of the norm of the aks is a convergent series. Um, and so this being a non-negative series as well, since it's absolute values, uh, this is also convergent then. Um, so just like we said here, so this implies that the sum of the absolute values of akjs is convergent. And so therefore, um, this is this is an absolutely convergent series, so therefore uh, the regular series without the absolute values also must converge as well, uh, because absolute convergence is stronger than regular convergence. Uh, and so what we have is that uh, the if you're if you're looking at an n-dimensional vector and then another n-dimensional vector and then another one, and you're adding them all up. You're just looking at the jth components of all those vectors. Um, that series, when you add those components together, that's a convergent series for every index j. And so then, since it's true for every index j, uh, that, gu that guarantees us that the overall series of vectors um, is a convergent series, because every individual component converges. All right, so back to the contraction mapping principle proof. So we're continuing on with that now that we've proven the little lemma that we wanted to show. Uh, so let's recall that we, what we want to show is that the sequence x sub k uh, is, uh, is convergent. And so what we're going to do is, we're in order to make use of that lemma, we're going to consider rewriting x sub k in the following uh, clever way. It's x0 plus x1 minus x0 plus x2 minus x1, and on and on in that way, all the way up to xk minus xk minus 1. And of course, the x0s cancel out with each other, the x1s cancel out with each other, all the way on up uh, to uh, xk, which is the only thing that doesn't have anything canceling with it, and so that's why it's equal to xk. So uh, another way of rewriting this then is that it's x0 plus uh, the sum j equals 1 to k of uh, this difference here, xj minus xj minus 1. And the reason for doing this is because we're going to take ak to be that difference, x sub k minus x sub k minus 1, uh, and that's for, uh, for every k. And now we're going to apply our lemma. So let's take note of the fact that the norm of ak, this is equal by definition to the norm of x sub k minus x sub k minus 1, and those things by definition are f of x sub k minus 1 minus f of x sub k minus 2. And so now that we've written it in this way, we can use the fact that we have a contraction mapping, that f is a contraction mapping. So this is less than or equal to c times the difference of the arguments, x sub k minus 1 minus x sub k minus 2. Uh, and that is, by definition, what uh, a k minus 1 is. So we have um, that uh, here we have the norm of a k is less than or equal to c times the norm of a k minus 1. Now we can iterate that because this was for an arbitrary index k. So we have the norm of a k is less than or equal to c times the norm of a k min a k minus one. That in turn is less than or equal to c times c times a k minus two. In other words, c squared times a k minus two. Uh, the norm of that, uh, and then you just iterate over and over. You can go all the way down to the norm of a mi uh, of uh, a one being multiplied k minus one times by this number c. Uh, and so then if you take the sum from k equals 1 to some arbitrary um, upper index r, so this is still a finite sum here, um, but you're summing the norm of those ak's, um, what you can do is you can rewrite that uh, in terms of the norm of a1, uh, because um, this is going to be at most uh, c uh, to the power k minus 1 times the norm of a1 uh, for every ak, and then the norm of a1 factors outside the sum. 
So now the sum um, is just over this part here, uh, the sum k equals 1 to r of c to the power k minus 1. And, um, and if you just remember what, uh, what this is, this is a geometric series. It's a finite geometric series. Um, and so just applying that formula, you have that this is 1 minus c to the r over 1 minus c, and then still multiplied by that norm of a1. Based off our geometric series for the finite sum, we can easily extend to the infinite sum now. So again, for the finite sum, what we have is this uh, finite uh, sum of norms is going to be bounded uh, by 1 minus c to the r over 1 minus c times the norm of a1. So since we have that c is a non-negative number that's strictly less than 1, then when you take the limit as r goes to infinity, in other words, taking the infinite sum, uh, where this used to be a finite sum, now we're taking the infinite sum, um, the limit as r goes to infinity um, first of, uh, of, of this portion here, the 1 minus c to the r over 1 minus c, that just becomes 1 over 1 minus c because the c to the r vanishes. Um, and so then what you're left with uh, after passing to that limit is that the infinite sum uh, of the norms of the ak's, um, that's going to be bounded above by 1 over 1 minus c um, times that norm of a1. And this is a finite number, and this is a non-negative uh, series, and so it is therefore a convergent series. Uh, and so, therefore, by our lemma, since we have a, uh, a sum of norms that converges, then the sum of the vectors themselves converge. Uh, and so that is why we had to uh, use that lemma before, because we're making use of it here, so that now we have the, the sum of the vectors of the ak's converge to some vector a in Rn. Now let's relate what we just established back to our sequence x sub k. I'm not really sure why this is capitalized here, that's again just the typesetting. Sorry about that, not much I can do, but uh, in any case this is our sequence x sub k. Um, currently what we have is that the infinite sum of the ak's converges to some vector a in Rn. So uh, what we want to do is we want to determine the limit as k goes to infinity of x sub k. So let's reconsider the fact that x sub k is, uh, can be written in, in this funny way here. So x0 plus x1 minus x0 plus x2 minus x1, all the way on up to xk minus xk minus 1. Uh, and so that, in other words, is x0 plus a1 plus a2 all the way up to ak, because that's how the, uh, the ak's were, uh, were defined before. They were defined by these uh, differences of uh, subsequent x terms. So um, what that means then is when you're taking the limit of the x sub k's, that is the, the limit of, uh, of this quantity here, x0 plus a1 to ak, and the, we just established that the sum, the infinite sum of the ak's is, uh, is a. So the limit as x sub k uh, goes to infinity uh, is x0 plus that convergent vector a. Uh, so therefore, what we've established then is that the sequence of x sub k's, uh, it converges to some x, which is by definition um, x0 plus a. Um, and so also keep in mind that since x, capital X, our closed subset of Rn, um, the fact that it's closed, uh, that implies that uh, this limit point here, x, is also uh, in capital X. So then what we've shown is that we have a sequence x sub k, which converges to this point uh, x in, uh, in our set. So all that remains to show, then, is that x is the unique limit point in our set capital X. So finally, for uniqueness, uh, what we can do is we can suppose for a contradiction that our contraction mapping f had uh, two distinct fixed points x and y, rather than just having a unique fixed point. Um, well, what would happen then is that the norm of x minus y for these two uh, distinct fixed points, x, x and y, uh, that's going to equal the norm of f of x minus f of y, again, because they're fixed points, x equals f of x and y equals f of y. Uh, and then using the fact that f is a contraction mapping, that we have that this is less than or equal to uh, some number c uh, times that norm x minus y, but that is, of course, strictly less than the norm of x minus y, because c is uh, strictly less than 1. So then you have uh, this contradiction here, x minus y being strictly less than norm x minus y. So uh, red x, that's a contradiction, so therefore um, a single point x in x is, uh, is the unique fixed point of the contraction mapping. So we've established the existence and the uniqueness 
of a fixed point for this contraction mapping F, and so um, that establishes the proof of the contraction mapping principle. So the final item we're addressing in this video is the mean value inequality, which is the following statement here. So under certain conditions, which are these hypotheses outlined below, uh, we have this inequality. So let's address the inequality itself first. So the norm of f of b minus f of a, that can be bounded above by the norm of b minus a times this number here, uh, which is the maximum of the derivative of f, uh, where the uh, maximum is taken over all possible inputs x that are in this interval from a to b. Uh, so we'll address all this now, but, but this is going to give us a number, it's a scalar number. So basically the maximum of the derivative over a certain region uh, is a scalar that you can multiply uh, b minus a by, the norm of that, to guarantee you an upper bound on the norm of f of b minus f of a. Now what are all these things, b, the function f, b and a, etc.? Well they're down here. So a and b, these are going to be elements of a set u, which is an open subset of Rn. Uh, this subset with a circle underneath is my personal notation uh, to indicate openness of a subset. f is a function which takes the open subset as input and goes to Rm as the codomain, where Rm may potentially be a different dimension than Rn. Uh, this is a C1 function, in other words it's a continuously differentiable function, and A to B is a subset of U. Now when we say A to B here, keep in mind that A and B are vectors, uh, so this notation here is indicating the line segment from A to B uh, in Rn. And so in particular, when we're taking this maximum above, we're considering all possible vectors x uh, on the line segment from A to B. And um, over that interval, um, we're taking the, uh, the maximum of the norm of the derivative. And keep in mind here, the norm we're considering is the operator norm, uh, which is the understood norm uh, when we're dealing with uh, linear operators. So lastly, we will address the proof of the mean value inequality. So we prove it in the following way. We're going to define this parameterization function g, uh, which takes us from input space, the interval from 0 to 1, to rm by the following uh, function here. Uh, g of t is going to, by definition, be f of a plus t times b minus a. Now let's just con consider the argument of this uh, function on the right here for a moment. Um, a plus t times b minus a that is the line segment from A to B as t ranges from 0 to 1. If you think about it, when you plug in t equals 0, uh, you're going to be at the point A, and when t equals 1, you're going to be at the point B. Uh, that's just simple algebra. And uh, this is a linear function in, uh, in t. Not, we're not talking about f here, we're just talking about the argument itself. And, uh, and so, um, as a function of t, the function a plus t times b minus a is linear, and we're going from a to b. So that's a line segment from a to b then. Um, and so then we're taking uh, the function f of that, so the f image of the line segment from a to b. And that is what g is. So uh, let's take note of the fact that f of b minus f of a, that's equal to g of 1 minus g of 0. Again, we've already addressed that when you take t equals 1, you get b, and t equals 0, you get a. And uh, so then you get f of b and f of a, respectively, uh, for g of 1 and g of 0. So then, uh, what we can do is we can rewrite the norm of f of b minus f of a. That equals the norm of g of 1 minus g of 0. And we can rewrite that as the, inter as the uh, norm of the integral of the derivative of g. Um, going from the integrals going from 0 to 1, of course, because those are the, uh, the inputs 1 and 0 here. Um, and we're allowed to do this because g, take note, is a differentiable function because by assumption f is a differentiable function. It's continuously differentiable. Uh, and so, so that makes g differentiable and we can use the fundamental theorem of calculus to guarantee us then that the integral of this derivative here is going to be equal to uh, g of 1 minus g of 0. And so then uh, this equality holds true. Um, so now the advantage of doing that is that we can uh, establish the following inequality. We have that the norm of the integral is less than or equal to the integral of the norm. 
Now this inequality follows by the triangle inequality, effectively. You can notice, in fact, that this is essentially the continuous analog of the triangle inequality. The triangle inequality in its typical formulation is for a finite sum, uh, but here we're doing a continuous sum, basically, in other words, an integral, and so um, this follows in a, in a natural way. We won't discuss the proof itself, but you can easily expect that this would be true. Uh, you can basically take it to be, again, the triangle inequality. It's the continuous version of it. And now that we've established this inequality here, uh, we have one more inequality. We can say that uh, this quantity here is upper bounded by the maximum of the norm of g prime of t, uh, where t ranges from 0 to 1. And that's just following by basic geometry of what the integral is. It's the area under the curve. And uh, so in fact, this is actually the one-dimensional version of the mean value inequality. But the one-dimensional version is immediate uh, by geometry. Because on the right-hand side here, you have uh, the maximum of that function, and uh, that's going to represent the height of a rectangle, and the base of the rectangle is going to be uh, the interval from 0 to 1. Uh, and so that rectangle will necessarily have greater area than the area under this uh, function here for this integral. Carrying on with the proof, then, uh, we have that by the chain rule, uh, g prime of t, uh, if we want to calculate that, that's the derivative of f at the initial argument, which is a plus t times b minus a, and then multiplied by the inside, which is b minus a. So this is a, a multivariable uh, instance of the chain rule, but it is the chain rule nonetheless. Uh, so what that means is that the norm of g prime of t that equals the norm of this quantity here, as we've just said, and that can be bounded above by this quantity here, where you take the norm of the first item times the norm of the uh, second item. So, in other words, the norm of the product is going to be bounded above by the product of the norms. And that's true because here, on the left, we are using the operator norm. So then overall, if, uh, if this quantity um, here, this product is an upper bound on the norm of g prime of t, then the maximum of the norm of g prime of t over that interval t from 0 to 1 is going to be at most the maximum of that product. Uh, the maximum of the derivative of f um, for, uh, for an input x, where x varies along the line segment from a to b, um, times uh, norm of b minus a. And again, we're just changing from a plus t times b minus a back to x. Um, and so instead of t going from 0 to 1, we're having x go from a to b, but it's the same thing. Uh, so we're just uh, switching notation here. And so anyways, this basically is the end of the proof, because uh, therefore, uh, we've already said then that um, the um, maximum of g prime of t, the norm of that, is an upper bound on the norm of f of b minus f of a. So the, the norm of f of b minus f of a is bounded by this, which is in turn bounded by this maximum, and that is the mean value inequality. So this was a somewhat quick video in order to get us through the uh, proofs of the lemmas that were used in the inverse function theorem. Uh, so this is for the sake of completeness, really, if you're curious about the, uh, the proofs of those things and where they come from, and now you can, with full confidence, use the inverse function theorem uh, to your heart's delight. So uh, what we've done in this video is we've uh, done the reverse triangle inequality proof, statement and proof, and then similarly for the contraction mapping principle and the mean value inequality. So if you have been, thank you very much for watching.